Okay, and we are live. Hello, web shadowers. Thank you all for joining our session today. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting Dr. Fim, who will be teaching us about neurosurgery. As always, please remember the Google form will be posted in the YouTube chat box, as well as the description at the very end of the session. With that being said, Dr. Fim, you can get started whenever you're ready. Great, thanks so much, Sophia. And uh, thanks everyone for, um, for tuning in to, um, to this presentation. Um, like Sophia mentioned, my name is Martin Pham and I'm a neurosurgeon uh, in San Diego, California. I work at UC San Diego, um, for those of you who are familiar um, or from Southern California. And what I'll be talking to you about today is uh, a little bit about my path into neurosurgery and hopefully giving you a little bit of an idea about what neurosurgery is, especially if this ends up being something that you're interested in now or later on, um, something that you find yourself uh, becoming interested in uh, like I did. So uh, as a little bit of a, give me one sec here. All right, there we go. Um, I was a really <laughs> avid reader of Calvin and Hobbes. And I remember, you know, when I was um, growing up, going through childhood, high school, college, you know, I would come across a lot of these uh, comics that would um, kind of obliquely refer to neurosurgery. And I didn't really realize, um, you know, how little there is about neurosurgery or medical school out there especially when you're trying to find out more about it. And for those of you who are in the pre-health profession, trying to find out about medical school or trying to find out how to get into med medical school, uh, if you were to, to Google it or, or look it up, there's so much information out there. And then on top of that, if you were to look um, up on what neurosurgery is, it can be uh, even more vague on trying to find out uh, what the field is like, especially when you're trying to ask the question of if it's something that you wanna be a part of and something that you want to go into. And so the purpose of this presentation is to hopefully open up some of that path for you and uh, give you an idea, especially with medical school and, and neurosurgery to help you make um, those important decisions and to help you figure out, again, if this is something that you want to uh, dedicate your, your life to into this career. So in terms of an overview, um, I'm gonna go over a little bit about me and then a little bit more about medical school. Uh, lastly, of course, the, the main topic of this talk, which is about neurosurgery. And then I'll end with uh, any questions that, uh, that any of you have. So uh, a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Southern California. So uh, if there's anyone from California, you know that here in this state, there's only two seasons, spring and summer. And you can see here me enjoying um, one of those seasons. My childhood was fairly uh, straightforward. I think there's nothing um, you know, super special about it. Uh, I grew up learning how to play piano. And then uh, in middle school, I, I was a part of drama. I, I kind of sought out my interests at the time. In high school, uh, like most uh, people, you know, I thought playing guitar was super cool. So I, I spent my uh, weekly allowance and bought an electric guitar so I could give it a shot. Uh, and then of course, went through my uh, emo phase where no one was cooler than me. And I just uh, disliked everything else um, except for taking pictures where I'm smoldering like this. Uh, I went to Irvine High School. And um, after that, I actually went to college at UCLA. I stayed local. So I went up to Los Angeles and did my undergraduate studies there. Uh, I went to Northwestern for medical school in Chicago. And then after that, I did my neurosurgery training at USC, the University of Southern California. And these are the three hospitals that we practice at uh, for that time. And then I did an optional year at Columbia uh, after residency training in neurosurgery and this uh, subspecialty training was in spine and spent a year uh, at those hospitals in New York. So one of the first very common questions that I get asked is, you know, that's a lot of time, especially in education. So how long does it really take? And, you know, when I went to high school, I, I graduated at 18, like most people do. And then I went to college, um, graduated college at the age of 22. Um, I did spend an additional year, so I spent a gap year uh, doing research at UCLA, finished that at the age of 23, and that's when I went to medical school. 
So medical school uh, for me was four years. There are some options where you can do uh, extra degrees um, that might take extra time, or you can pursue a PhD that'll take an additional three or four years. For me, I just went straight through. So I graduated uh, medical school at the age of 27. And then uh, I chose neurosurgery as my training path. And neurosurgery training is seven years long. So it's the longest set of all of the um, training options. So uh, I actually finished training uh, at USC at the age of 34. Then I took an additional year uh, in fellowship at Columbia, finished at the age of 35. And um, now currently I'm at UC San Diego. So that is a long time. And especially when you're looking at it from the vantage point of say a pre-health student in college and you're you know, anywhere from 18 to 22, or say you're doing a gap year in your early 20s, it can seem very um, daunting, I think. But I'll, I'll also tell you that this is me um, as a pre-med at 19, and then this is me as a neurosurgeon at 35. And so my advice or my thoughts is that the time passes by anyway. And I remember thinking when I was 19 and 20, the the road of life, um, and I, I couldn't even see past the curtain of my late 20s and everything else was the equi uh, equivalent of old age. Um, but I'll say that, especially when you're contemplating a career in medicine, uh, a surgical specialty, and even neurosurgery, the time will pass by anyway. So the most important thing is really determining if, if this is gonna be the field for you. Uh, next, uh, I'll talk a little bit about medical school. So important questions that I often get are things like, do I have any advice for pre-med to apply for medical school? Should I take a gap year? What extracurricular activities should I do? What GPA and MCAT score are high enough? Do I need to have research? What kind of volunteering activities are good? Is it a good or bad thing to go straight through um, or to be a non-traditional applicant? And all of these questions are, are very, very good. The thing is, is that from my vantage point here in this diagram at the bottom, um, I can answer questions that are very good if you are currently in neurosurgery residency and have questions about what kind of job to take or uh, where you want to practice or what kind of surgery you wanna do. I can answer really good questions if you're in medical school and you're thinking about going into neurosurgery or you're contemplating different specialties that you wanna go into, or you're preparing an application to, to go into neurosurgery. But if you have questions like that about getting into medical school, you'll see that the time frame between getting into medical school and becoming a neurosurgeon for me is a 15 year difference. So I would say that for up-to-date advice about quote unquote, getting into medical school, your best bet is to ask current applicants, current medical students or pre-med counselors, be a part of workshops, um, and they'll, they'll have the best up-to-date advice in the next step of getting into medical school itself. But what I can tell you is a little bit about medical school. And as um, many of you may know, when you go to medical school, one of the best <laughs> and most fun things that you can do is decide what you want to do with your life. And so, um, you know, as you can see here, you know, when you come into medical school, you're sort of undifferentiated. And every medical student goes through this kind of plinko path of, of anything that they want to do. So on the first day, you can imagine yourself becoming, you know, a family medicine doctor, an orthopedic doctor, a pediatrician, you can become a neurologist, an ob -GYN. you can do eye surgery, become an ophthalmologist, become an internist, and trying to figure out what specialty you want to do is, is kind of one of those fun things um, to try and decide what you want to do with the rest of your life. Now, how I chose neurosurgery then, um, it was really three main reasons. And those three reasons are the nervous system, surgery itself, and the types of patients that neurosurgeons see. So uh, I'll, I'm going to tell you why I chose neurosurgery. So just in case when you start going through that own path, if you do, uh, if or when you go to medical school, um, if you find that this uh, is very similar to what you're thinking of, it might tell you that neurosurgery may be the right field for you as well. So the nervous system. Now, when you get into medical school, um, 
you are going to have the opportunity to learn about every single system in the human body and how it works normally, as well as how it uh, works uh, or doesn't work when things go wrong. And the way they break that up are things like the cardiovascular system and the pulmonary system with the lungs, microbiology, where you learn about all the different types of organisms that can attack the human body, the renal system with the kidneys, GI with the bowels, hepatobiliary, right? So the liver and the gallbladder and the pancreas, genitourinary, the, the bladder and the urinary tract, musculoskeletal, so all of the muscles and tendons and ligaments, hematology, all the things that travel through your blood, pathology, all, all the things where, um, you know, that can go wrong with the organs, especially in gross anatomy, you learn all of this stuff. And I remember learning all of it. And I, I was very interested. I mean, it was the whole purpose of why I went to medical school. So I was very fascinated to, to learn about all these things. But I will admit that when I came across the nervous system, um, it was just like a light bulb went off and it was the most amazing thing and opportunity and, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess privilege to learn all, all the different types of things that run through the nervous system. And so when we were going through our neuro unit, uh, there was this genuine enthusiasm and interest that I had much more above every single other body system that we were learning at the time. And this is an example of all the notes that I took during the nervous system. And this was by sort of um, uh, a genuine and spontaneous choice to really try and to understand everything that I was learning. And I think what I realized was that for medical school and for the nervous system that we were learning at the time, this was the chance and essentially the last chance to be formally educated on the bodily systems. And so for me, this was the, the chance to be formally educated on a nervous system. And I genuinely wanted to learn it as best as I could to establish a foundation for what was turning into a choice to choose a career where I would be thinking about this for the rest of my life. Um, and that was something that, that found me in that way. So that's the nervous system. Um, the next reason why I chose neurosurgery was surgery itself. So uh, one of the, again, the best choices and the, uh, the best opportunities to decide what you want to do with your life when you go to medical school is to decide if you want to be a medical type doctor or a surgical type doctor. And for me, I, I never knew any surgeons in my life. Um, no one in my family was in medicine. The only physician I ever knew was my pediatrician. So when I went to medical school and started interacting with my um, medical students, some of them already knew that they wanted to do surgery. So I asked them, how do you know that you want to be a surgeon? What, what is it where you're in school right now and you're already looking into different types of surgical specialties? And they all told me something very similar in that they all enjoyed working with their hands. They all, um, you know, grew up doing things with their hands. They, they derive a lot of enjoyment with it. And so when they told me this and I began thinking about myself, you know, if, if this was something that I, I really wanted to do, I also thought back. And, you know, here is, um, this is a picture of me in kindergarten where I built this ridiculously large Abraham Lincoln and I was very, very um, happy about it. So happy that my mom took a picture. Um, this is me in uh, high school and college, taking apart uh, my car at the time. You know, my friends and I love to, take things apart and put things back together and, and try and really figure out how, how things work. And we really enjoyed um, doing stuff like that. Uh, this is me in college and medical school. I, I really enjoyed shooting pool, which, a, which is a very technical um, hobby. And then even now, after the fact, um, I've gravitated towards woodworking, which uh, by nature is also a very hands-on hobby and pursuit that, that deals a lot with tools and I, I derive a lot of enjoyment from it. So when I was in medical school and reflecting back on the things that I enjoyed, I realized that I also really liked working with my hands. And now people are telling me that surgery is an opportunity to work with your hands and help people in medicine. And for me, it was again, like a light bulb went off. It was like the, the perfect opportunity to go into a job where I, I get to do things that I really 
enjoy, genuinely enjoy doing, which is working with my hands. And I get to help people at the same time. It was, it was a total win-win, um, win-win choice and win-win solution at the time. So between the options of medicine and surgery, surgery was um, the slam dunk choice for me. Um, the last reason, oh, <laughs> this reminds me. So this is a picture of me in 2006. Um, I am at Guppy Tea House. For anyone who's from California, um, Guppy's Tea House is this um, place where young people just loiter after hours and get milk tea and brick toast, as you can see in this image. This is probably like 11 p.m. or if not midnight. So I'm out with my friends. We're in college. There's, there's nothing to do. And um, brick toast is just something that you get. And I was given the honor to cut the brick toast. And here I am um, cutting it. Uh, fast forward 10 years later, and there's a, um, a scrub nurse who took a picture of me operating in the operating room. And she showed me this picture and it jogged my memory of, of this from, from more than 10 years ago now. So I put this together and I sent it to my mom. I'm like, mom, look at this. Isn't it so interesting? You know, 10 years difference when I'm in college and, you know, you thought I was going to be homeless and fast forward 10 years and, and I'm a neurosurgeon operating in the OR. And I, I swear to God, she sent me back this message, son, I knew your brick toast cutting skills would get you somewhere someday. So again, kind of just to my point, um, sometimes the field will choose you. And it, um, in retrospect, it was obvious that surgery was, was always going to be something that, um, that I was going to go into. So lastly, um, the third reason why I chose neurosurgery, which is the, the patients themselves. So as you can probably imagine, by the time you need a neurosurgeon, um, you're not doing that well. Um, you've been told that you have a brain tumor or that that tumor is cancer. You've had an aneurysm rupture. So you've either had um, you know, a massive stroke or bleeding in the brain, you've been in a car accident and you have head trauma, or say in that same accident, you fractured your spine, you have a broken bone somewhere along the neck, mid back or low back. That can also result in a spinal cord injury. So now you can't move your legs, you can't move your arm and your legs. Say you've been told you have spine cancer and there are tumors pushing on your spinal cord and your nerves. Um, you might have a movement disorder. So you tremor and you shake so much that you can't put on your clothes, you can't feed yourself, um, you can't take care of yourself. Say you have epilepsy that can't be controlled with medicine. And so now you're in constant fear of cooking or swimming or driving for fear that you have a seizure and hurt yourself or, you know, or even put your, your life at risk. Or, you know, one of the most devastating situations, say you're um, blessed or fortunate to have a child and you're told that your child needs neurosurgery for any one of these reasons. So if you need a neurosurgeon, um, things in your life are, are not great. And I remember being in medical school in my first two years, like I showed you, I was so excited. You know, I'm like, oh, I, I love the nervous system. I'm so excited to, to dedicate my life to learning about the nervous system for the rest of my life. And, oh, I love surgery. You know, I, I'm so excited. Um, to, to pick a field where, where I can work with my hands my entire life. And I was so enthusiastic about those things where um, it didn't occur to me until finally I shadowed my mentor. I, I shouted my, my neurosurgical mentor um, and it gave me pause because when I shouted him for the first few times, I would watch him walk into the hospital. I would be right by his side. And then I would see him stop by nearly every single ICU room and talk to these patients and families who were, who were essentially going through the worst times in their lives. And he was there to walk them through it. He was there to be a part of it, to offer what he could. And sometimes it wasn't much. Sometimes the surgery was not effective enough, was not grand enough, was not, um, uh, you know, was just not enough to reverse whatever injury had happened. And I watched him do this, and um, it was definitely a special moment because I realized that neurosurgery, beyond just the technical aspects of the nervous system and surgery, there was this humanistic and philosophical component. And I thought it was such a special thing 
to be able to enter a field and be a part of these people's families and lives and help them through for so many of them, the worst times in their lives that they will ever go through. Um, this is a picture of me with uh, the first person that I ever saved. And um, I was uh, 28 at, at the time. Uh, so I was a second year resident. And um, at USC, we are trained pretty quickly to be familiar with surgery. So by the time we're a second year resident, a lot of us are operating independently. So we know the basics of bringing someone to the operating room, doing a surgery, closing it safely for a lot of the basic neurosurgical surgeries. So um, I remember being on call and the ER called me that uh, this man had come in as a trauma. He'd been in a car accident. He was completely in a coma. And um, they showed me the scan and he had this massive bleeding in the brain. So as we were trained to do, I evaluated him because of the life-threatening bleeding in the brain. I made, I made the decision to bring him to the operating room. I brought him up. I spoke with the anesthesiologist. I said, you know, this is the plan. Um, I'm alone in the operating room, right? So I'm uh, 27, 28. Uh, I've been trained at this time to do the surgery. So I, I do it like, you know, like any other technical aspect, right? Like we're trained how to play an instrument, like we're trained how to do a sport. Um, I open the skin, I open the skull, I find the bleeding, stop the bleeding, I take care of the brain, close everything back up, exit the operating room safely. Um, he goes to the ICU and makes it, right? So um, for, for something where he could have died, he gradually wakes up in the next few days, still really out of it and ends up going to a rehab unit. And I, I don't see him again. I, you know, I see so many people on a daily basis and it was really early on in my training and I'm, I'm just trying to stay awake and, and learn as much stuff as possible. And I'm in clinic probably about five weeks later and I'm in the back and um, one of the nursing staff comes back and says, hey, Dr. Pham, there's someone here to see you. Um, you know, his, his name is, is this. And I, I don't really recognize the name. And um, I'm like, well, what, does he have a question for me? Is, is something wrong? He's like, well, he, he says he wants to see you because someone told him that you saved his life. And I go out to see him and he's, he's clutching this piece of paper that the rehab unit gave him. And he says, um, you know, I, I woke up and the first thing I remember is being in this rehabilitation unit and someone had to tell me what happened that I was in this big accident and that I almost died and that uh, a person named Dr. Martin Pham saved my life by doing surgery. And he was, um, he was in tears because of, um, because of this, you know, just waking up and realizing that he could have died. And here I am, you know, I'm, I'm 28 and um, so many of my friends are, are not in medicine. They have their own careers. They, you know, they have wonderful cars and houses and they're building their lives and families. And, and I'm disheveled, you know, I, I'm, I'm like barely sleeping every night and, and, and trying to just um, do the right thing. And here is this man who's, who's coming to me, thanking me for saving his life. And it was such a poignant moment for me, you know, got 28. I, I'm, I barely consider myself an adult. You know, we, we just come out of, um, uh, gosh, medical school. And here I am having the opportunity. And it was such a poignant reminder of why I did this. And he asked to take a picture with me um, and was, um, you know, kind enough to, to let me share it in the future. And again, it just reaffirmed for me the types of patients that neurosurgeons see and why. I chose neurosurgery, right? So again, to go back to the three reasons of why neurosurgery um, was it for me, I love the nervous system. I love working with my hands and the opportunity to take care of patients who are in the worst potential events in their lives. When you take all of these three things that equals neurosurgery, right? There's, there's no other thing in medical school that would capture these three things. So I guess the, the biggest question becomes that if this is why I chose neurosurgery, then what is neurosurgery? And um, that's what I'm going to go into as the last portion of this um, 
of this talk. Um, there are a few questions coming in uh, in terms of getting nervous and how long there are. Um, I'll definitely answer those questions um, uh, after I go through uh, about neurosurgery too. So I just wanted to say that I do see your questions here. So what is neurosurgery? Um, the definition of neurosurgery is the surgical treatment of neurologic disease. I mean, that, that's fairly self-explanatory within the name itself. But what that really means is the surgical treatment of the brain, which we can uh, refer to as cranial surgery for the cranial vault, as well as the surgical treatment of the spinal column, which are the bones, and the spinal cord, which is the nervous system in terms of the spinal cord and nerves. And we capture that within spine surgery itself. So this can be broken down into certain subspecialties. And those subspecialties are things like oncology, vascular, skull base, functional epilepsy, spine, pediatrics. And I, I swear to God, I kid you not, when I was in medical school and I looked up neurosurgery and I saw these words that at the time I, ve I had very little understanding, um, my first thought was, was actually, um, I was very underwhelmed. Um, and I remember thinking, God, I, I thought neurosurgery was supposed to be cool and, and badass and and I'm looking at all these words and, and, you know, none of it seems cool at all. Like, what am I missing? And I looked up the Wikipedia page of neurosurgery and I, I, I swear to God, this is not, this is the exact same page um, that I screenshotted a few weeks ago that I saw back in 2006, nothing about this page has changed at all. And I read it from start to finish and I understood probably 10 to 15% of it. And again, I just was so underwhelmed. And I remember thinking that it was probably because I didn't understand what, what all of it was. Um, but the reason why I bring this up is because you know, now, fast forward 15 years later, there are so many more resources about neurosurgery. And especially with this talk as one of those resources, I wanna be able to show you what neurosurgery is and at least illustrate for you what I was not able to see short of shadowing my neurosurgeon at the time. And nowadays there are so many video atlases, there are so many resources for college and medical students about the field itself, about all of the subfields, um, a lot more uh, surgical um, video databases to kind of go over the, the technical aspects of, of neurosurgery that can help you make that decision. And um, I'm going to try and show you, since I have you as a captured audience in this talk, again, what, what neurosurgery is in um, a brief video that I made. Now, uh, I do want to apologize, and I do realize that in streaming, this video may, may come off a bit choppy, so I, I, I do apologize for that. But hopefully, uh, it'll still illustrate for you, um, you know, in this brief amount of time, what, what neurosurgery is. So... In this video, it's about six or seven minutes long, I'm going to capture for you um, several types of neurosurgeries to illustrate for you um, what neurosurgery is like, okay? So the first thing you're gonna see is what's known as a bedside ventriculostomy. This is something that we do in the ICU or even in the ER trauma bays. When someone comes in as an accident, sometimes they can have high intracranial pressure. So we have to access that compartment to vent that pressure. What you're seeing here is an actual twist drill. This is the scalp. This is the patient's nose. So this is in the, an ER bay. We make a hole in the skin and then a hole in the skull to access the brain. Once this is done, we insert in this catheter, which is like a flexible tube, kind of like an IV. We put it through the brain down into a compartment in the brain called the ventricle, which makes CSF. Once we can enter that compartment, um, it vents the CSF, which allows us to control intracranial pressure. This is actually cerebral spinal fluid here, which you can see is completely clear and allows us to both control and monitor um, the intracranial pressure. The next surgery is a brain abscess evacuation. So this is a um, burr hole. We're making burr holes in the skull. This is the skull itself, kind of ivory in color. Uh, I'm making a, um, uh, a window into the skull. The covering of the brain is then peeled back called the dura. This is the brain itself at the center. You can actually see the pus here right now. So pus, an abscess is just pus, right? It's just a collection of a bacteria. So we remove the abscess um, because the brain itself isn't able to remove so much of that volume. And then we irrigate it out. 
and then uh, we close everything back up. So you can see here the dura, it's, it's literally being sewn closed with stitches. The skull flap or the bone flap is reinserted with these small titanium plates that are less than a millimeter thick. And then we close the soft tissue back up. So you can see here the skin and the muscle being closed. Uh, this is the eyebrow down here. The patient's ear is right here. So he's looking down at the bottom corner and um, everything is closed again. So you can actually see his ear right here. Um, the next surgery is a brain tumor resection. So removal of brain tumor, you can see here the scalp being reflected back. This is the skull, this ivory color. We're again making um, burr holes, which are these uh, small portholes in the skull that we can then connect with a craniotome, or if any of you are in war working, it's exactly like a router. So we actually connect those holes together and then we can lift uh, oh, that window of the skull off temporarily to access the brain. You can see here the um, pearly color of the dura, which is the covering of the brain. This particular type of tumor is a fairly bloody tumor. It's eroded through the dura. And you can see here um, removal of that tumor, which is kind of bloody, which is why it's all red. We have special tools to remove it. And then we find the plane that, that lines up right against the brain itself. Here's a normal brain and the tumor has been removed. We lay down the special material to, to stop the bleeding, which is called um, hemostasis or hemostatic material. And then once that's done, we put the skull back on. Um, and then here are the small plates in the skull and we close everything back up again. Um, the next type of surgery is another type of surgery. This is called a glioma, which is a brain tumor that comes from the brain substance itself. So you can see here the normal ivory portion of the brain. These are special electrodes that we're using to find the motor cortex. Um, and we're stimulating the motor cortex here. There are different ways we do it nowadays, um, but that's how we used to do it gosh, about eight years ago, there's a thin layer of non-functional brain over the normal brain itself. So that's our access corridor. And here is the tumor itself. You can see how it's very grayish. This is what's called a CUSA or a cavitronic ultrasonic uh, aspirator. So it vibrates the tissue and then we suction it away. And here is finding that plane of the tumor. This is all tumor against the normal brain itself. We lift that off. And then this is the cavity um, that's left. Again, we put on this uh, material to stop any of the bleeding, and then uh, the surgery is done. The last brain tumor surgery is called a ventricular papilloma. So this is an entire hemisphere of the brain. So if any of you who are familiar with neuroanatomy, this is going down the interhemispheric fissure, which is the space that separates the two cerebral hemispheres. Um, going down this fissure, we're going to come across the corpus callosum. So as, as some of you may know, the corpus callosum is the white matter tract that connects the left and right hemispheres together. You are looking at the corpus callosum right now. We can actually split and make a very small window in that structure without affecting the function to access the ventricular system. You can see here the ventricular system itself, which makes CSF, and that CSF is clear. So CSF is completely clear like water. It's essentially filtered blood that's filtered of all of the, the blood cells. Um, this is the tumor itself. So it's this cauliflower um, type appearance and we're actually pulling it out of this structure. It comes from the choroid plexus, which is its cell of origin. That's why it looks like that. So we um, you know, amputated off the vascular pedicle. This is what the, the space looks like after you're done. And again, the entire cerebral hemisphere, you can see the pulsations, which are the pulsations from the um, blood itself. The next is a clip ligation of an aneurysm. So now um, what you're looking at here is the frontal lobe of the brain, the temporal lobe of the brain. This is the optic nerve and the optic chiasm, okay, where the optic nerve comes together. This is the carotid artery as it comes inside the brain and it splits off into all of its branches. So for this particular type of surgery, we're operating on the blood vessels of the brain itself and we're working around the normal structures of the brain. So as opposed to brain tumor surgery, where we have to remove the brain tumor from the brain substance. Here, we're working around the anatomical structures of the brain to get to the blood vessels, which live in this space. In this particular case, we're operating on an aneurysm, which is a ballooning of one of those blood vessels that ruptured. So we're putting in um, this aneurysm clip, which is like a, um, a metal clothespin that goes right at the neck of that balloon so that the aneurysm can't rupture or, or bleed anymore. Um, and this is the uh, goal of the surgery in this type of vascular neurosurgery or neurosurgery on blood vessels of the brain. This is another surgery on blood vessels of the brain. 
So what you're looking at is the cerebellum. This is the arachnoid. So if you've ever learned of the layers of the brain, you can see why the arachnoid is named that way because it looks like a spider web. Here are the two hem uh, cere cerebellar hemispheres. So you're looking at the cerebellum. These are the blood vessels going around the cerebellum. You're looking at the brain stem here. So this is the pons. This is the medulla looking at it from the back. In this case, we're sewing these blood vessels together. Each one of these squares is one millimeter uh, in length. So you can see how small this uh, instrument is and this needle is when you're looking at a millimeter um, in terms of that background. The blood vessels have been sewn together in this way, kind of like two pant legs being sewn together. So the blood vessels are bypassing an aneurysm. We can put in a special dye uh, that we can look at under the microscope to make sure that the blood is flowing appropriately. And um, again, you'll see here the final view. Again, you're looking at the back of the brain. So this is the cerebellum, blood vessels, the brain stem from the back. Like I mentioned, neurosurgery also involves spine surgery. So completely different view. This is a patient's back. They're lying on the table where you're looking at very small incisions into the back itself. And you can see completely different types of instruments. This is a much more macro surgery. You're looking at screwdrivers and taps and inserters. And you're looking at a um, type of neuro navigation system. We're actually looking off screen so that we see where all these instruments are going so that even though these incisions are small and you actually can't see it visually where these implants are going, you can see off screen on a, a navigation system that these screws are going into the bone, around the nerves um, and around the blood vessels. Uh, spine surgery is also open surgery. So what you saw was minimally invasive. This is an open surgery. You're looking at the thoracic spinal cord right here. This patient had spinal cancer that involved one of the bones. So we had to remove the entirety of that bone to remove the cancer that was pushing on the spinal cord. Because the um, vertebral body and the bone has been removed, we actually have to put in another strut graft so that the spine can still sit on itself and the patient can still sit and stand and work biomechanically um, with all the activity that they uh, normally do. You can see here the screws and the rods going in as a biomechanical structure to, to bypass that, that area and, um, and reconstruct that area. You can also see that even though everything is open, you know, a moment ago, you saw the spinal cord, everything still closes at a single incision line. And um, man, that's it. So um, that was a whirlwind through nine different types of neurosurgical procedures to illustrate for you what that all looks like. Now, even though um, that's what it looks like, right? What you may not see is what all of the knowledge um, that goes into performing all these procedures, right? So if you remember that surgery where we're splitting the cerebral hemisphere and going through the corpus callosum, these are the schematics that teach you, or rather the schematics where you have to learn how to do that safely. You can see here, right, the craniotomy. So there's that window. Here's the corpus callosum. Here are the pericolosal arteries. This is the angle and the surgical aperture to access the ventricular system. Once you go in, this is accessing the third ventricle. These are all the different surgical corridors to try and avoid all of the anatomical structures that you're going around. Here's the fornix, right? Here's the thalamostriate vein, the septal vein, the cord plexus that you should see coming down. This is how the patient is positioned. Um, we don't shave the head like this anymore. This is like a, a funny looking haircut that, that is terrible um, for people to recover from. Nowadays, we just shave um, kind of where we make the incision line, but you have to understand how to position the patient's head. These are the three-dimensional representations of all of the anatomical structures. So even though you saw just the brain and just the microscope going down, you have to understand as a neurosurgeon, going down that hemisphere, going through the corpus callosum, where the fornix is, right? Where the blood vessels are. You can see here coming across, going from the, the back of the brain, appreciating the, the cerebellum. Uh, you can see here the, the craniotomy opening, right? So for that surgery where you were looking around those blood vessels, although that's what you saw underneath the microscope, to perform that surgery, you have to understand how to make that window into the skull, how to access the, the base of the skull, right? When you look at this diagram, this is actually what you saw, 
right? The optic nerve coming into the optic chiasm, the carotid coming into all of its branches. Here's the third nerve, the ocular motor nerve, right? This is the, uh, gosh, the cella turcica and the optic nerve and, you know, all of the clinoid processes and where all of the anatomical structures travel around, which you have to understand to perform these surgeries. These were surgeries that I did as, um, as a chief resident. Uh, you can see here the brain tumor um, and then the brain tumor being resected and kind of understanding going around all of the normal structures to do that safely. Another exceptionally large brain tumor. This was a 23 year old uh, woman who came in with headaches that just kept getting worse and worse and worse. Obviously you can see here, she had this brain tumor that was fully resected. This is another brain tumor. This was a 33 year old drummer who came in to see me because he, he realized he couldn't read his sheet music anymore. And he was having trouble talking because this tumor was pushing against the optic radiations. It was affecting his language and his understanding of language. Um, and this being uh, fully resected as well. Like I mentioned, neurosurgery is also spine surgery. So these are schematics on how to perform minimally invasive spine surgery to put in these metal implants into the bone, around the nerves, around the blood vessels. You can see here other schematics, people who have spinal cancer, where you need to reconstruct the spine and in reconstructing the spine, safely work around the spinal cord and the blood vessels, in addition to putting in these metal implants to rebuild those portions of the spine more schematics in not just understanding the spine and where those retrieval bodies are, but where the blood vessels are, right? So in working around the spinal cord in the thoracic spine, I have to understand here's the aorta, here's the heart, here are the lungs, and to make sure I don't injure those as I perform surgery. These are scoliosis surgeries that I performed in fellowship, right? So you can see here the scoliosis, that curvature, straightening out the scoliosis. Each one of these implants is the size of your middle finger, Right? So there, there are very large screws that we put into the bone to control the spine and reconstruct the spine. Again, you can see here scoliosis and then um, fixation and of that scoliosis. This was actually a 49 year old woman hunched over, you know, like an old lady because of the spinal deformity that she had and then reconstructing and rebuilding her back so that she can stand straight up again. This is a young uh, 32 year old uh, master student. So she has this terrible deformity from Marfan syndrome. She could barely breathe because her lungs were collapsed. So we rebuilt her spine to give her back uh, more of that space for her lungs. So she can actually uh, breathe and concentrate. In doing so, it actually gave her um, six inches of height um, in correcting that deformity that she had. And again, a last example of spinal cancer. So you can see here, these bones of the spine, normally they are square. And here, just um, cancer eroding through that bone, uh, pushing on the nerves in the back. You can see here the nerves of the um, spinal column. Here are the, the screws going into the bone. Removal of the square bone itself, you can see on the x-ray, and then reconstructing with this corpectomy cage so that the patient can stand and sit and allow for the biomechanical passage of force um, across that area. So. Uh, gosh, neurosurgery, um, the surgical treatment of neurologic disease, right? So again, uh, going back to the definition, the surgical treatment of the brain, which is cranial surgery, the surgical treatment of the spinal column, the bones and the spinal cord, which is spine surgery. Um, you know, unfortunately, actually, um, you know, at UC San Diego, the volunteering program is still suspended. You know, I, I had the gosh, the, the pleasure of, of having both undergrads and um, medical students shadow me um, just before COVID hit. And um, still, unfortunately, um, although we're making headway with the pandemic, it's still shut down. But the, the positive signs are, you know, um, programs like this, like web shadowers um, popping up and, and building these opportunities for people to see all different types of physicians across the country and, and something I'm so um, happy to be a part of. And so in the spirit of virtual shadowing, if you um, were to shadow me, this is kind of what it would be like. Um, this is walking into uh, my hospital, our hospital at UC San Diego. The surgical suites are on the second floor. So this is kind of walking up. The hospital is designed really nicely so that patients, um, I mean, it, it's already hard enough to be sick. So they can at least be in an area that, that has a nice uh, healing atmosphere. This is going into our surgical pods. So we have a total of 26 ORs. 
in any given day, each one of those ORs is having a, a different type of surgery, right? Which is really cool to kind of walk through and see, even as a surgeon myself. Um, for this particular day, when I was recording, um, this is what the operating room looks like. If and when you shadow a surgeon, just know that anything blue is sterile. So stay at least two feet away, don't touch anything sterile. Those are my residents setting up the case. Um, this is me uh, putting on surgical loops. So neurosurgeons will use surgical uh, loops, which are kind of like telescopes that allow us to see the field um, up close, even though we're far away. And uh, oftentimes we can wear a headlight um, to allow for that illumination. So sometimes you'll see these in pictures or movies or shadowing, and that's just to allow us to see in our field of view. For this particular case, I was doing a, a spine surgery. So that's my you know, clinical field of interest. And nowadays we have different types of technologies that allow us to use robotics to um, design and predict and, um, and place a lot of these types of um, surgical implants. Uh, this is what that looks like. So you can see here a lot of specialized tools for robotics cases. It looks like, like a hardware store, um, you know, the most accurate hardware store you'll ever see with these different types of tools that allow us to accomplish our surgical goals. And this is at the end of the day, my, my residence kind of closing. And um, if you were with me, you'd see me, you know, gosh, take off my, my blood filled surgical loops. Um, and then at the end of the day, kind of a late day, um, I used to wear scrub hats, you know, um, because they're so cool and, you know, Grey's Anatomy makes them look really cool and I have a lot of pictures of them, but nowadays I, I'm kind of a lunch lady hat kind of guy because I still see patients and, and that way I don't get um, too much hat hair. So, uh, man, if this talk, um, I'm sorry, if this image is neurosurgery and, uh, and what you just sort of saw, then, then this talk is just one point of it. You know, I have gone through my own journey. I've gone through why I chose neurosurgery. I've gone through what um, cranial surgery, brain surgery is, what spine surgery is, um, illustrated schematics, showing you videos. But I'll say that even though I tried to kind of capture as much of a broad illustration as possible, um, this talk is only one small part, really, of of all of the different types of perspectives of what neurosurgery is, of what it means to a variety of people. Um, but hopefully it gives you an idea you know, of, of neurosurgery. Now, I will say, like I mentioned earlier, one, one important thing to consider is time, right? So neurosurgery is seven years time. It is the longest training um, period of, of all of the subspecialties that you can go into. And seven years is a long time, especially if you're graduating medical school. If you've gone straight through, you're still in your mid to late twenties. And if you've taken time off to do uh, another degree or to do, cause you're non-traditional or say you've had another career and you've come back to medicine and gone through medical school, then you might be in your early or even mid thirties by the time you're graduating medical school. So seven years goes across very important parts of your life. And I'll show you visually what seven years is. So I, I have a half brother, His, um, he was nine when I was an intern, so PGY1. When I graduated neurosurgery, that's seven years later, here I am as a PGY7 and he was 15. So again, a visual representation really of what seven years is like. So it is an important decision and an important consideration in picking neurosurgery because seven years is a long time that goes across a lot of your real life. That being said, um, I'll say this is um, a picture of me as a med student at 27. And again, a picture of me as a neurosurgeon at 35, right? So my, my point here, again, is like I mentioned earlier in my talk, the time passes by anyway, whether you become a pediatrician or a subspecialized pediatrician or a general surgeon, or an internist or a subspecialty of internal medicine, the years will pass by. And the most important thing, the best thing that you can do in medical school is to pick something that you care a lot about, that you're passionate about, that gets you out of bed every morning. I promise you neurosurgery gets me out of bed every single day. Um, and it's something that I would still do and go back um, and do all over again. So Oh, gosh, I think that ends my presentation. Um, just enough for questions. So again, thanks for um, 
for for sticking it out, um, especially if you're on the, the East Coast uh, in the uh, late afternoon. Um, for those of you who uh, want to reach out, I'm I'm always more than happy to to you know to answer any of your questions. You can always email me. Um, I'm on Twitter and Instagram as well. My my Twitter account is more of my professional stuff, so you'll see. Um, you know, screenshots or, or intraoperative pictures of what I do um, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. And my Instagram is actually more of my journey. So I realized I have the unique opportunity to kind of give you stories from college and medical school into residency and into now, and I can actually jump back and forth. So there are so many great accounts on Instagram on medical students who are going through their journey, residents who are going through their journey, and you can live their life in real time. And I guess um, I found that my, my role in being able to contribute is actually to show you different points in time, like flipping through a book. So um, feel free to check it out if you want um, to give you an idea. And uh, let me open up the chat box again and uh, see some questions that, uh, that I can answer. Just give me one second here. Um, all right, the first question that I have here, uh, did you ever get nervous or overwhelmed trying to save someone's life or talking with the families about um, the worst day of their lives? So um, I'll tell you that it is, there is um, a, an emotional cost to it. And I think when you're in medical school, you will find out the type of person you are. When you're in medical school, you will shadow and be a part of teams that will deal with these types of situations. And you will find very quickly if you're the type of person that can do that, if you're the type of person that doesn't like it. And that will steer you in terms of the kinds of specialties you're, you'll, you're going to go into. One of my best friends in medical school, she found that she didn't like those situations. She felt very uncomfortable. And so she went into orthopedics, right? She deals with sports medicine. She deals with athletes on a daily basis. She deals with young people and she operates on them and allows them to go back to their high performance lives, right? And that's phenomenal for her. On the flip side, there were people who went into palliative care. There were some of my classmates who wanted to be a part of end of life for every single family that they dealt with and, and worked through. And for me, that, that, was, that was even too much for me, right? So in terms of being nervous and overwhelmed, um, I, I was nervous, nervous in a normal way because it's, it's a tough time for these people, um, but I was never overwhelmed. And I think that that was just a personal thing, right? It's like getting on stage and giving a speech. Being nervous is a part of it. There are some people who have stage fright and never wanna give a speech ever. And there are some people who are okay with it. And for me, I was okay with it. And that was the first step in deciding that, um, that I was okay with choosing this as a career. Um, and I wanted to be a part of it and to, to do it as, as best as I can. How do you manage long surgeries and stay calm during emergencies? Um, again, I, I think a part of it is personality. A part of it is learned. You know, in medical school, you will go through um, different training scenarios. You'll do this whether you go into ER where anything is potentially a, is an emergency or trauma surgery. Neurosurgery is a part of that as well. So it becomes a part of the culture and how to deal with it. You know, if you train in the military, if you become a Navy SEAL, um, I mean, I'm sure there's a class where they give you a, a rubric on how to deal with an emergency, but it's a part of the daily training in, in how to deal with these types of scenarios. And neurosurgery is no different, right? And so a part of it is, is the acceptance that you're a personality type, that you will be calm. And then the rest of the training is, is building on that, right? So for me, um, I found that in a variety of, of emergencies, when people are dying, when people's hearts stop, when, when people are, are actively floating away, um, I can think clearly. Um, you know, I'm, I'm nervous. Uh, I'm, a part of me is wondering, God, what if, what if they die? What, if, what is their mom going to say? This is a child. But there's a part of me that can actually put that to the back of my mind. And the front part of me is still able to work. And um, again, I think a, a part of it is your personality, but a good part of it is learned. So if you are exceptionally nervous, it's something that if you love neurosurgery, if you love ER, if you love trauma surgery, if you love these high paced types of careers, something that you can still be very, very good at. Um, 
I've heard that surgery subspecialties such as neuro, cardio, uh, plastics, and ortho, there is no such thing as work-life balance. Can you talk more about that? Um, I, I would like to disagree. So that may have been true back in the early 2000s, um, but I'll say that nowadays the field of medicine as a whole is much more respectful of work-life balance. You know, as a neurosurgeon, as a cardiothoracic surgeon, as an orthopedic surgeon, you will naturally work more than someone who is a dermatologist, right? Someone who is a pediatrician. Um, but the understanding that there is a life outside of medicine is greatly respected now. When I was in training in residency, so 2010 to 2017 was when I was in residency training, half of the residents were married. Half of those half had children. And of those who had children, they were multi-physician families, right? So one of my very good resident friends, his wife was an ob -GYN. They had two kids when he was in residency. Another good friend, um, his wife was um, a GI fellow, right? So they had one kid in residency. Um, at UC San Diego, there are two, um, no, there are, there are three, oh gosh, I'm, is it two or three? There are two to three neurosurgical residents who are female, right? And naturally, as you imagine, if you're a woman in neurosurgery, you're in your late 20s into your early 30s, naturally, you may be a part of your life where you might consider having a family, having children. Um, that is not a taboo topic. So for women in neurosurgery, and it really depends on your residency training program, I'd like to think this is like this all across the board. But if you're a woman in neurosurgery and you want to have children or start a family, that is um, a valid part of the discussion and welcome so that, you know, that the resident um, complement can, can accommodate your life choices. Um, again, when you are in training, you will naturally work more, right? So I, I can't say that you're going to have an, an easier life. You know, a dermatologist out of training works from nine to two, I don't know, three to four days a week and has every single weekend off. For me, I work five days a week, right? I operate one to two days a week. I have clinic two days a week. Like today, I have an admin day. Um, I'm on call certain days, but everyone is free to have a family if that's in if that's what you want to do. If you want, um, you know, so I, I definitely don't think that the days where you have to choose your profession over a family or over your personal life are are long over, and it's. Um, it's very, very doable. I, if you're worried about work-life balance, but you love neurosurgery, I, I wouldn't let it deter you. If you want to be a stay-at-home parent and you want to work part-time because you want to homeschool your child or, you know, you want to be that involved and then a surgical specialty may not be it for you. So that's where the, the line may have to be drawn, but um, a, a healthy, lovable, you know, personal life, whether it's a family or whether it's your hobbies and you want to go mountain climb on the weekend um, is definitely still doable. Uh, gosh, next question. Can you perform the same spine surgeries as ortho trained spine physicians? And what do you feel distinguishes the two types of training for the same end goal of a spine surgeon? So yes, spine surgeons can be trained on the neuro path or the, uh, the neurosurgery path or the orthopedic spine surgery path. Um, they are two different goal, uh, there are two different routes to essentially the same profession. Um, I trained with neurosurgeons in my spine training and in fellowship, I trained with orthopedic surgeons, right? When you look across the board, there's a, there's kind of a, um, I like to think of it as a, um, a healthy collegial rivalry between orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons on who quote unquote is better. At the end of the day, there are excellent neurospine surgeons, and there are excellent orthopedic spine surgeons. Um, there are also terrible neurospine surgeons and terrible orthopedic spine surgeons. Um, it, it ends up being who you are as a surgeon. Now, the training path is exceptionally different. Neurosurgeons uh, spend seven years in training. Um, there's a lot of research out there. I, I published some of it with my orthopedic spine surgeon colleagues, but in neurosurgery training, we train for seven years, 30% of that is spine, right? So one out of every three cases that we do involves the spine. Um, orthopedic surgery, you train for five years and only about 5% of that is spine. So one out of every 20 cases in your five years is gonna be spine. And then you do an additional sixth year 
where all you do is spine for 250 to 350 cases, right? Um, so it's been shown that for early spine surgeons exiting training, neurosurgeons are on a group as a whole more comfortable with the spine because we just do more of it more often. That being said, when you fast forward five years, I personally believe that it's a wash, right? Um, I'll also say that um, I have met and some of my friends who have exited orthopedic spine surgery training are exceptionally good surgeons because of the residency programs and fellowships that they went to. So I would say that if you're interested in spine surgery now as a pre-health student or a medical student, just look at the training. Neurosurgery is brutal, right? Um, if you want to go into spine, but the thought of seven years dealing with 60% of patients of the brain who are going to be families who are dying, where it's going to be emergencies, people are hemorrhaging in their brain and you have to do something about it right away. And it's a small compliment, right? Two neurosurgeons in the entire hospital in each given year. That is a different life choice than say going into orthopedic surgery where there are 10 residents in any given year. And um, you, know, you deal with how to fix bones and you also deal with um, you know, uh, orthopedic trauma and broken femurs and hand surgery and, and joint surgery. And you also work with the spine and you're gonna do a dedicated year in spine surgery afterwards, right? So um, it, it's just a different life choice. Um, I like the spine and I found it in residency. That being said, I love neurosurgery as a philosophical field. And I would say that um, that is going to be a greater determinant on, on whether you pick orthopedic surgery or, um, or neurosurgery. Um, let's see, next question. How do you know you didn't hit something important that will impair the brain? Um, is it true that sometimes patients are awake for brain surgeries? Um, so I did see this question pop up as I was going over my video. The, the short answer to this question is basically training, right? I mean, this is why neurosurgery takes seven years. This is why we spend so much time understanding the anatomy. We spend so much time trying to understand the, the topographical map of the brain, where all the structures are in the brain. So the short answer is how do you know you didn't hit something? Well, one is you try not to hit it by understanding where it is. It's like um, memorizing a map um, of uh, driving a car in the dark, right? So if you memorize the map well enough, then the, the things that you see will allow you to travel safely. Now, you sometimes do know if something important was hit because during the surgery, we do special types of monitoring. So certain functions of the brain can be impaired in real time and we can notice that in real time. If you hit a blood vessel, then it's gonna bleed. So you, you also know if you hit something that you weren't supposed to hit. Um, or sometimes you just visually see it, right? Say you're taking out a tumor. Uh, sometimes you can see what the tumor looks like and what the brain looks like. And if you inadvertently injure the normal brain, then oftentimes you'll, you'll see that happen. But the goal of surgeries and the goal of becoming a surgeon is to try to navigate all of that um, prior. Is it true that sometimes patients are awake? Um, that's true. So at, at UC San Diego, it happens, um, gosh, maybe once every one to two weeks for what we call awake brain surgeries. Um, we have special technologies here that patients can be awake for surgery. And that's because certain functions of the brain like language are best um, monitored while the patient's awake. So essentially they're asleep for the you know, portion of the brain that's being opened. And then during the tumor resection, they're awake and parts of the brain can be stimulated so that they can be um, protected. Um, for me personally, I'm, I'm lucky enough and fortunate enough to be in a department of like 20 different types of neurosurgeons. So as I showed you, there's, there's maybe six subspecialties. In each of those subspecialties, they can further be subspecialized. And one of the reasons why I chose to work at a university is because I can be free to do what I love in spine. And that way, if someone comes in with a special type of brain, uh, brain tumor that requires awake brain surgery, I can send it to my friend and colleague who does it for a living. So I know that he, I mean, he's an expert in it because it does it, you know, almost every single week. And likewise, he can send someone to me with a spine problem because I do something like that also every single week. Um, but it is true, uh, very uncommonly, 
uh, sorry, very commonly, that patients are awake for surgeries. At what point in your career were you allowed to operate alone? So in residency, you are allowed to operate um, alone or under supervision. It will depend on the type of residency training program that you attend. There are a hundred different types of residency training programs in the country. And depending on which program you go to, there are different philosophies on how to, um, how to gradually give you the skills where you're comfortable operating alone. There is nothing special about operating alone, right? You don't have to be a certain age. Operating alone is an acquisition of a skill, right? It's like learning to ride a bike for the first time. I mean, you know, certainly after you're five or 10 and, and you have enough, um, you know, dexterity and balance, anyone can learn how to ride a bike, whether you're 10 or whether you're 30, but you have to be able to do it the first time. So surgery is no different. You have to be able to do something, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 times safely under supervision, and then you can do it alone. For us at USC, we do that during our first and second years out of our seven year training program so that we can operate alone by the time we're in our second year. There are some residency training programs where that doesn't happen until you're in your third year or until you're in your fourth year. And that's just by nature of the structure of it. The purpose of every single training program, whether you operate alone in your second year or your fourth year is by the time you exit at your seven years, you are a safe, independent neurosurgeon. And um, choosing a training program just comes down to the philosophies of each program. What is the longest surgery you have performed? Oh my God. The longest brain surgery I performed has been, um, uh, it was uh, maybe like 22 hours. So um, no, not 22 hours. Uh, it was like maybe 18 hours. So it started in the morning and went deep into the night. Um, the longest spine surgery I performed was 26 hours. So that was a, a patient with a, a terrible tumor at the base of the spine, which required removal of the tumor. Of those 26 hours, um, I was scrubbed for all of it except about 30 minutes. So um, yeah, myself and, and my, um, my staff surgeon, uh, essentially about maybe 19 hours in, he was like, hey, do you want to like go grab a snack and, and go to the bathroom. So, so I did, but I mean, as I left the operating room, he was the only other surgeon there. So I, I didn't want to like, just, you know, take a nap for an hour and leave him alone. So I, I, I ate a snack. I um, went to the bathroom and then I went back in and he did the same. And then we continued. And a common question is, God, that's a, that's a long time. Like, how do you, what about your bodily functions? What about hunger? I, I think the adrenaline in the system really shuts that all down you know, as you will learn in medical school, you make a CC of urine, like every, what is it, every minute, I think. Um, and I think that slows down um, as you're doing a task. And it's no different than any like athletic, you know, climbing a mountain, you know, where, where you have to do it without food or drink for a while, or again, being in the military. Um, and so it's definitely possible, but um, that that's the longest surgery that, that I've been in, in terms of spine. Can you talk about, um, let me see, 310. I, I want to be respectful of everyone's time, of course, um, but, but these are the last two questions that I see. Can you talk about PEDS neurosurgery? Are there any pediatric neurosurgery fellowships out there? How different is patient care when communicating with parents of kids versus adult patients? So uh, pediatric neurosurgery is a separate subspecialty of neurosurgery as well. You do the same seven years of neurosurgery, learning all of the basic neurosurgical principles, and then you are required to do one dedicated year of pediatric neurosurgery after you graduate. Um, there, there are pediatric fellowships. So nearly every major university has a pediatric neurosurgery fellowship and they take fellows who are fully graduated neurosurgeons who have opted to take another year to learn purely pediatric neurosurgery. So for example, UC San Diego has a fellowship, USC where I train as a fellowship, every major university has one. And the types of neurosurgeries you do there are any type of essentially neurosurgical problem that may affect a child. That includes brain tumors, that includes spine tumors, that includes epilepsy, that includes, um, you know, developmental problems, that includes, um, you know, uh, what we call craniosynostosis. So children who are born with heads that are not shaped as a sphere where they need a reconstruction, cranial vault reconstruction. So as a pediatric neurosurgeon, your primary goal is taking care of children 
And your skill set now is much broader, right? To take care of all of the types of surgical problems um, that may affect children um, in the brain and the spine. Um, communicating with them is, I mean, it, it is different, but, but really no different because you're, you're treating the families. So you're talking with the, the parents of these children and it can be, to be honest, it can be much more high stress because um, for the families, they, you know, they have raised what they thought to be was this perfect child. And then now they're told that not only is something wrong, but something is potentially life-threatening and something can potentially be, be permanent in some neurologic way. So talking with the families is a special uh, skill that is developed and also something that you either find that you can do or can't do because parents, um, which are essentially adults with children, are definitely not at their best when something's wrong with their child. And to have the capacity of empathy to understand that and to have the sensitivity to that takes really special people. And that's why special people go into pediatric neurosurgery. Um, let me see, how much of the brain is still unknown or not fully understood? So there's a lot of it. Um, that's probably not the most, um, uh, that's probably not the most um, satisfying answer. Neurosurgery is only one profession and career that deals with the brain. When you look at the vast careers that deal with the brain, you have neurosurgery where, um, you know, we deal in the surgical management of things that deal with the brain and spine to get through things safely that have to be done, right? You have neurologists that deal with the function of the brain that don't require surgery. You have psychiatrists and psychologists that deal with the, um, the, um, you know, psychological, psychiatric personality function of the brain. You have neuroscientists that deal with the neuroplasticity and the connections of the brain that result in consciousness and function and injury, right? So there is a lot of the brain that, that I would argue that is, that is understood um, in terms of being able to navigate it safely, but that is still not understood. And so if, if the brain itself is something that you are exceptionally interested in as a pre-health student, then it's not just medicine where you can, where you can go into. There are a lot of different types of professions um, to do that. And I'll, I'll take this last question since it was kind of asked at, at the last end, what happens to the body if it's under anesthesia for that long? Um, to be honest, uh, that, that's, a, that's a better question for anesthesiologists who are required to monitor the body. Um, people can be under anesthesia for an exceptionally long time. Um, certain things can happen that, that in recovery have to be dealt with. So the, the body is managing fluids differently. The body manages blood pressure differently. Um, and, and that's done afterwards in the recovery setting. But, um, you know, the short answer is, is a lot can happen, which um, is a great question for anesthesiologists and intensive care doc unit doctors but it's definitely possible to do so um, if, if people are required to do so. So um, thanks again for, for staying past time. Um, I, I don't have YouTube live open, so I, I'm not quite sure how many people uh, stuck it out. But um, again, uh, I, I really wanna say thanks for, for inviting me to such a wonderful platform and, and for giving me a venue to talk about what I obviously care a lot about, which is neurosurgery. And um, if any of you have any questions, you can feel free to reach out to me on, on any of these platforms. Um, and I'll be happy to chat with uh, my experience or answer, answer any of your questions that, uh, that you have. So thanks again. Thank you so, so much, Dr. Pham. This was an absolutely fantastic presentation. We loved how you included a video um, to show all those surgeries. It was so cool. Everyone absolutely loved it. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you for answering all of our questions. We really appreciate it. <laughs> well, you're, you're very welcome. And again, um, kudos to you for, for putting this together. This is a really amazing, um, I mean, Web Shatters as a program looks like it's, it's phenomenal. So um, great job. And I, I, I wish you all the best of luck in, uh, in your careers. Thank you. Thank you so much. For everyone still watching, the Google form has been posted in the chat and it'll be in the description of this video shortly. And you have 30 minutes from now to fill that out.